Good morning and welcome to our Sunday service, Facebook Live. We're really excited to be doing this for you and for all the people who love the Center for Spiritual Living in Reading. I especially want to thank Damien for being here and setting up the video and all the equipment that it takes. And we have Reverend Andy Torkelson with us today to give you a spiritually uplifting message. There are a couple of announcements I want to give you, and we're doing more by Zoom than we've ever done before, obviously, but Sacred Sisters is by Zoom, and Reverend Sue's Lunch with Ernest Holmes is now done by Zoom. And I'm doing Ernest Holmes, a class on Ernest Holmes essays by Zoom. So it's a really exciting time to get good with that, and uh, Zoom is now upgrading as we go, so you may have to end up with a password at some point. But anyway, those are the very little announcements. I am here in the office Monday through Thursday, 9 to 3, around 9 to 3, and uh, answering phones and doing my stuff that I have to do. And so if you have any questions, feel free to call. And if you have our newsletter, you have all the contact information you'd ever want, phone numbers and uh, other ways to connect with the people in the center. We have a new Facebook group for all of us, too, that Lori set up. So right now, I'd like to get into the contemplative part of our service with Damien, who's going to give you a reading that'll be followed by a prayer and then our wonderful guest speaker, Reverend Andy. So Damien. Good morning, my beautiful and blessed brothers and sisters. Today's reading comes from Science of Mind, page 414, Ernest Holmes writes. To rise above the contemplation of conditions is to enter that field of causation which makes all things new in our experience. From this viewpoint, there is no hard and no easy case to handle. All cases represent but different phases of the human belief, and one would yield to the truth as quickly as another if we were sure of our spiritual position. So please join me in this prayer. We are very sure of our position here. We are one with all that is. We are one with our brothers and sisters. We are one with nature one with the universe. What an incredible time to be remembering that, that we're all in this together. And so this morning I feel enlivened by the words of Reverend Andy because I know he has got all of this wrapped up in his beautiful heart. And I know from his experience in paradise that he knows the difficulties that we all go through and challenges that we face in these times. And yet we go back to the one, always trusting in God, always trusting in our soul's journey, knowing it's right and perfect no matter how bizarre it may seem at times. So in support of one another, we send love to each other and love to all the people who need more attention and love. We say thank you, God, for the ability to do this. We're so thankful for this center and all who support it. And so I release these words into the universal law knowing it is so, and together we say, and so it is. Reverend Andy? Good morning. It's a real pleasure to join you wherever you are this morning. And uh, it's a real honor to be in, here in this beautiful center. And I wish you could be here, but I know that you are here in consciousness. We're here in technology. So some years ago, I was uh, good friends with a family who had a teenage son. And uh, he, was, uh, he was a great kid. He, he was very athletic. He did really well in school, got really great grades. He was preparing himself for college. He was a high school kid. Uh, he was quite a soccer player, and he also ran track and cross country. And uh, for this incredibly accomplished young man, he was um, really always upset with the fact that he wasn't an artist. He would say, you know, I, I'm not an artist. And 
I wish I could be. And he had this incredible yearning to be an artist. And he took, he had taken a drawing class in junior high and he'd taken one in high school. And uh, he didn't, he didn't do very well in those he thought. And he, he, you know, he'd say, I can't draw a stick person. I can't draw a circle. I can't draw anything. And so uh, being, um, and, and this is uh, kind of embarrassing to say, but you know, sometimes we, when we hear young people say things like this, or I don't believe I do this anymore, but I used to do this, you know, you could kind of placate them. Oh, sure, you know, everybody's an artist. I'm sure that you're creative in your own way and that, and that type of thing, just to try and make him feel better. And, uh, and, and, and to acknowledge that he was a great kid. So I remember uh, some time went by, and um, I went over to their house one time. They were going to have a barbecue or something, and uh, the uh, the wife and mother of the family said, "Oh, you know," she said uh, to the kid, "Hey, you know, show show Andy your room." And and I'd seen his room several times. It's like, oh, you know, and he was kind of shy about it, something about his room, and oh no no no, go go show him the room. He'd really like to see it. So. Uh, so he took me there, and, I, and I'd seen his room a couple of times in passing. You know, it's a typical teenager with the posters up and things like that, and excuse me, his favorite sports teams or whatever. But uh, I went in there, and I was just awestruck. Um, what he had done is he went in there, and he had painted the wa- walls stark white, you know, taken everything down. And then he'd, he'd uh, gotten a hold of um, jewel-colored paint of about five or six colors, a half a dozen color jewel, these intense colors. And uh, he'd gone in there, and he had splattered and dripped all over the walls, this paint. It was kind of like a Jackson Pollock kind of thing, but the, it was this entire bedroom. And I remember walking in there, and I was just awestruck. It was edgy, it was chaotic, it was gorgeous, it was beautiful, it was, it was powerful. You know, he, he didn't have anything on the walls except for the paint, and his own, you know, he had furnishings. And they talk about great art as being something that touches our soul, not, not just the fact that it looks like something, it looks like a covered bridge or whatever, but something that really touches our soul. And I remember that day... Uh, my soul was just filled, and, and I, I felt a, an intense uh, connection to what he had done in that room. And so I thought, I thought about that for a long time, you know, this kid who, I, I want to be an artist, I want to be an artist, I want to be an artist. And let me, let me drop in the word for a moment, creative. Let, let's say that for a moment. So I want to be creative, and somehow I don't feel creative. And so it's, it's very interesting that, you know, this fact that I want to be, you know, where does that come from? The fact that it was there. Uh, nobody gave him this creativity. He didn't go to the store and buy it. He didn't go to a class and, 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 found, and find it there. Somehow it was within him, and, and, he, and he, he found the outlet. And what this kid did, and, and he, was, he was one of those kids who was very much on track for college and scholarships and stuff. He would take sometimes within the same quarter or semester he would take three or you know two or three different math classes you know and he was taking he took all he took pre-college stuff and all the way through and he was getting himself lined up for scholarships and things like that and so by the by the middle of his junior year he kind of had it all dialed in you know he could kind of do what he wanted in in high school and um and, and, and it was the beginning of his junior year that he had done this room. And, and there was something that, that broke loose in him at that point. And about midway through the year, he was going to pick classes for a second semester or quarter or whatever they were on. And one of his, uh, a girl who was one of his friends said, hey, why don't, why don't you take a sewing class? And, you know, you know, that's crazy. I don't want to do that. You know, yeah, come on in, you know. And so he goes in and, and he, find, he finds the fabric and he finds the technology of, and, and and he was, he was taught to use kind of the technology of sewing and creating. And, and this kid just went crazy. He began to design his own T-shirts. He began to make his own clothes. He was making shorts. He made T-shirts for friends of his. And again, his creative outlet came, began to come forward. And then in his senior year, he did something he'd never done before. He had always taken English classes that were, you know, pre-college and getting ready for things and and. And, and those types of things, but he decided to take a creative writing class. And, and what, what he produced was amazing in terms of poetry and self-reflection and, and, and being philosophical and, and looking at the world in a particular way. And so 
what what this what this says to us is that there is there is something there is there's some sort of an alignment that happens in the way we look at it in metaphysics and, and especially religious science and and new thought is that you know it's about aligning with something you know, what what is that you know Ernest Holmes talks about early on and, and any of you have ever heard me speak very much I kind of go back to this because I, I love the way that he he starts his his textbook the science of mind. Where if you look at the textbook as a, as a body of work, it is, um, it is so affirmative and so creative and it's so filled with the divine and it's so inspiring. You know, for, for hundreds of pages, he, he inspires us. But he starts off in the very beginning with this idea, he says, basically, if there's all this abundance in the universe, if there's all this creativity, then why as human beings do we tend to be sometimes poor and afraid? and weak, and and those kinds of things. It's a very sobering kind of question. Then he moves into the inspiration. So I think about about this idea of a kid who who has all kinds of talent. He has all kinds of things going for him, but he's got that thing. He's got that thing that I want to be, you know, whatever that means to him, creative or artistic. And, And somehow... There was there was there was a there was a, a limited way of being within his thinking. There, I'm not an artist, you know, and I'm sure that, you know, some people would say, well, throwing a bunch of paint against a wall does that make an artist? Well, for him, it did. It released something in him. Now, when I when I got involved in new thought and, and metaphysics. Many years ago, uh, my wife Judy was who I'm married to now. Before, be, long before we were married, she introduced me to religious science, and I was someone who was really struggling with my life at that time. And we were friends, and and I think that she saw something in me, and she knew that I was looking. And so, hey, she is. There's this there's this place that has this great teaching. I think you'd get a lot out of it because I think she knew that I really wanted to change my life, and I did. But I was. I was very turned off to religion, and that's a whole other story, but I, the way I'd grown up, and I, I just didn't want traditional religion the way that I knew it. And when I take a look at why I didn't like traditional religion in, in, in terms of what I was exposed to, now this was my experience, and I'll, I'll, put, I'll kind of wrap this up really quickly, is the idea that um, I felt like in order to be the person I want to be, in order to be, let's say, a better person in some way, shape, or form, I had to find, go out somewhere and find a peace. Because basically, the religion taught me that something was missing. You know, call it original sin, call it whatever, you know. Yeah, you know, you're a human being, and you got all this going on, but there's this peace missing, and this is what takes you away from from your greatness. This is what takes you away from God. So this takes you away from from how you can you change yourself, save yourself, uh, expand yourself, um, to to transform yourself. And I found that, and this is I'm simply speaking for myself. I found that to be, and I didn't realize it at the time until years later when I analyzed it. I found that to be shaming somehow, like I'm not enough. Well, I, I had a lot of I had a lot of exposure to that growing up that I wasn't enough, uh, and. And, uh, and I'm not putting that on anybody. That's, that's what I gave sanction to. That's the, the information around me. That's the way I interpreted it, that Andy wasn't enough. And so then I was going to go to a religion and try and fix myself, and they would say, well, by the way, you're not enough. So that didn't appeal to me. And Judy knew that about me because of conversations we had. And this is why she said, you know, I think that there's this teaching, there's this place that you would really like. Okay. So I went. And right away, what I discovered was, you know, instead of, instead of going out and getting something or, 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 or going through a ritual or, or, or looking to a, 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 a deity of some kind to, to please, please pull me out of the soup, so to speak, they said basically this idea that what is going to heal you is a combination of your imagination and your creativity. In other words, you are going to create change in your life. Wow. And I, I, love, I, love, the thought, I love the thought of that. But how did that work? So I went to a number of classes early on, a lot of religious science classes, Ernest Holmes and people like him. And, 
and turned on to all kinds of ideas. And I really, you know, I just, I just really OD'd on classes. I, the minute I got involved, I was, I probably did three, four, five years straight of classes. Every time they had a class, I was there. I repeated classes. I really wanted to get this. But this idea of how I created change was interesting to me. It was hard for me to actually grab a hold of. And then in one particular class, we began to explore the work of uh, Charles Fillmore, who is the, the co-creator of Unity with his wife, uh, Myrtle Fillmore. And Charles Fillmore talks about the way that creativity works. And he, like they all do, but he referred this to the Christmas story. And I know that, you know, here we are in spring and we have Easter coming up and stuff like that. But I, I want us to go back to Christmas for just a moment. So Christmas in March, okay. Uh, April, I'm sorry, Christmas in April. So um, he says, we have these two characters in the Bible from this mythological story. And one of the characters is a woman named Mary. And so he says, okay, Mary is this person who um, this, this angel came down named Gabriel. And he said to her, and what the Bible says is, he said, um, uh, he said that um, you have been found to be in good favor with God. And so you're going to have the opportunity to bring forward uh, the Christ. And, and you are going to be the, the vessel for that. And you're going to be impregnated and you're going to give birth to the Christ. And what Charles basically, that we look at that as being, you are in alignment you were in alignment. So alignment, okay, what? Because, because I, I've had, you know, I, I had all kinds of great ideas about myself. I had all kinds of great ideas about what, what I wanted life to be and, and, and everything, but I wasn't, uh, the, some of the changes weren't taking place, and this is where I was getting hung up. And Fillmore says, Gabriel, in talking to Mary, said, you're in alignment with. You're in alignment with spirit. So what's the alignment? And Fillmore said, it's an alignment between personal consciousness which is my frame of mind, our frame of mind, our self-esteem. Uh, do we feel uh, talented? Do we feel intelligent? Do we feel free? Or do we feel other things? Do we, feel, do we have low self-esteem? Do we feel limited? Okay. So Fillmore says it's an alignment be, be, between our, our personal consciousness and our divine reality. Oh, so that's where it is. So basically, Mary represents in the New Testament, when Gabriel came forward, this messenger, that she, is in, that she was in alignment, that her own consciousness was in alignment with her divine reality. Ernest Holmes, in all of the, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the teachers that we study, they talk about this idea. They talk about this idea about you know, our consciousness becomes the, the lens through which we see and live our lives. It's almost like we're, we're looking at the world, we're looking at our lives through a, a clear piece of glass, but there's these things that come down that reflect back to us. And those things can be positive things, they can be negative things. So in other words, I wanted to change, but did I see it within myself? to have the capability for that. So then Fillmore says, once the idea is that our consciousness is aligned with our divine reality, then what Mary represents is the idea that once she accepted, accepted what was coming through her, she was all in. That was it. And Fillmore talks about the idea of pregnancy, that when a woman becomes pregnant, that's it, you're all in. That if you, if you decide to carry that to term, then you're all in. And there's no going back. And every single day you wake up and I am pregnant and I'm going to have this child and I'm going to carry it to fruition and I'm going to deliver it every single day. There's no question about it. There's no checking out. There's, no, there's nothing that says, well, I don't know if I feel uh, worthy of it today. I don't know if I feel like doing it today. I don't, I don't know if I, if I can live up to it today. It simply is that we are there. 
And Fillmore talks about the idea that in terms of, of commitment, in terms of the idea that we can take this forward in absolute, uh, a discipline about it that's a natural discipline. This is just what I'm doing. And what's really interesting, if, if, we, if we lay the metaphysical and the metaphorical to one side and we bring the, the mythological story and we lay that next together, now let's, let's tie those in. Let's think about this idea that at that particular time, 2,000 years ago, a Jewish woman who was not married becomes pregnant. Now, that's a mind blower to the culture and to the family. Can you imagine how much flack she got for that? Okay, can you imagine how, how, how devastating that was to her family and her friends and, her, and, and everyone around her? And then, you know, when her mom finally came up off the floor from passing out, she probably said to Murray, well, well who is it? Well, there's this angel named Gabriel. Oh, my God. Girl, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? You know, she, I'm bringing something to fruition, and then suddenly what comes in our people, and, and very often they're well-meaning people, saying, what are you doing? What, what are you talking about? This is what you're going to do. What do you mean you're going to put splatter paint on the wall? What are you talking about there? And so, but Mary, and this is what Fillmore says, Mary just continues the course. She just goes on. No matter what, that is her dedication to bring the creation to fruition. And then we have another character, which is Joseph, which is now Mary represents the sacred feminine and Joseph represents the sacred masculine. And for Joseph, his, his role in this whole thing is to be the supporter of it, no matter what. The person who, who brings forward the, the resources and the guidance and the direction to have, you know, it's, it's like... It's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go build a circus and I need my best friend to help me out. And this guy is not going to tell me how crazy I am. And this person isn't going to put me down for it. He's going to support me no matter what. A, a healthy relationship. A relationship that is, is all in with us. In psychology, this is called good boundaries. Joseph represents uh, healthy boundaries. And so... When you, when you work with people in, in, uh, in, in therapeutic modalities, people who really want to change their life, one of, the, one of the aspects of it that you want to put into place is to talk about establishing healthy boundaries. In other words, for some of us, there are some parts of ourselves that are so difficult to change that when we get into it or, or we're called to do something, we're called to change directions in life, we're called to bring forward a new creation, a new manifestation, that's going to be hard enough and so we, do, we need people who are on our side. And that's where boundaries come in. I had an experience like that. I had worked for um, Solano County for 20 years, a Bay Area county. I worked in juvenile corrections as a group counselor. And I worked with, in parole for a while with them and some other things. 20 years. And in, in after 20 years, actually after 15 years, I was pretty burned out. I was wondering which direction I should go. I got some counseling. I stayed in classes, uh, spiritual classes and whatnot. And when it came time for, to be, for me to be there about 20 years, an opportunity appeared to me. Uh, let's call it my own Gabriel, you know, in consciousness. This idea began to come to fruition to go to become a, a minister. A religious science minister. And I didn't know what I was going to do with that. And then eventually the center in paradise opened up and I was living there and an opportunity came for me to go there and to go to work there. I remember calling my dad. Uh, my dad was living in Arizona and my dad was a guy who worked 35 years for PG&E, a really hard worker, loved PG&E, just loved it. That was his thing. He did it for 35 years, got his retirement, got his gold watch, you know, moved to Arizona. I called him on the phone and I told him what I was doing. And my dad was always someone who really kind of stayed out of my life in terms of, he, he never really, you know, he, he never really gave me a lot of advice about things. He didn't really pollute my thinking. It's just like, yeah, you know, Andy, he'll find his way, you know, whatever. And I was kind of surprised because he said, you know, well, how old are you now? You know, and so I told him and I, you know, and 
I was older, but not really, not as old as I am now, definitely. But anyway, and so um, he said, well, how long have you been with Solano County? And I said, 20, I said, 20 years. He said, well, you're too young to retire. I said, Dad, I'm not retiring. I'm changing careers. And oh, well, why would you do that? I mean, you, you need to stay there. So, you know, you've got, you, you work for a union. You work for a county. You work for government. You got all your benefits. You got everything. Why? I, I mean, I, I'm afraid you're making a really big mistake, you know? And at that time, he, you know, and, and God bless him. I mean, the, and I know, see, I know that he loved me. He cared about me. That's why he was saying it. But it's kind of like Mary's mom, like, Mary, what are you doing? Right? Okay. And so, so he was saying these things. And I found, I found that my own, my own consciousness and my divine reality part of me was starting to kind of become disengaged. And I began to really run on some fear. And I had, to, I had to turn to some people around me, and I had to turn to some teachings to kind of tune myself up. I had to, I had to reestablish my boundaries. And so with my dad, healthy boundaries was that was something I couldn't talk to him about. Not because he's a bad person, but I couldn't handle it. This was a, a tough enough situation for me to go through on my own in terms of my own calling, let alone to have someone like that. And so... Fillmore talks about in terms of bringing forward creation, you know, the, the first of all, the, the, to, to, to align our consciousness with our, with our divine reality, which is we are whole, complete, and divine. That there is something within us that, 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 that lets us know that we are more. I, I think I'm an artist. I think I'm a minister. I think I'm a whatever I am, you know? And, and then... And, and, and somehow that bubbles up, but, but then to begin to settle into an acceptance of it. Because you see, in terms of change, creativity is an openness and an acceptance to what is already there. We don't have to go out and get something else. It is in here. But we have to open up and we have to accept it. And then we have to establish the healthy boundaries where we can protect ourselves. You know, there's a gentleman who I um, admire very much. His name is John Bradshaw, and he's no longer with us. He was, um, he was someone who was in the recovery field, uh, PhD, um, in, incredible mind, an incredible presence in the field, uh, recovered alcoholic himself, um, uh, very Catholic, very religious. And, you know, for some of you who may remember this, PBS ran a series, Bradshaw on the family and things like that. And Bradshaw was someone who, who looked at family dynamics and how they play into our lives and how they affect our self-esteem and, and how we feel about ourselves and how we show up in the world trying to sort out our issues and our problems. And he talked about the idea that when he was asked one time, someone asked him, what do you think is the, what is that one thing that you can point to that seems to cause a lot of malady among human beings? And he talked about the idea of shame. He, he called it toxic shame. It, it, it happens when our self-esteem kind of goes on steroids. When, in terms of our negative self-esteem, our negative self-image. This is why Holmes' question at the beginning of the textbook is so incredibly important. I'm always amazed at how we are drawn to this teaching. And if you're watching today, you're drawn to this teaching because we love the optimism of it, because we love the divinity of it. We love the mystery of it. We love the fact that it tells us that we are whole, complete, and divine, that there is something within us. But how... At some level, we want to keep that at arm's length. Like, somehow we have to prove that this is true. I was doing a group recently where I, in my day job, I run groups during the day and uh, in, a, in a therapeutic situation, people who are recovering from things. And there was a gentleman, a middle-aged gentleman, and, and, and I was doing a group on this one day about this idea of something higher within us. And we would call it the Christ. We would call it the higher self. 
And so in the environment I work in, you know, I, would, I was using, you know, our, our higher ethics, our higher morals, our higher selves. The power that we seem to have as a human being that transcends the physical us. And that's where I was trying to get to. And I had a group of about, let's say, 12 to 15 people in a room kind of sitting in a circle. We're having a conversation. I presented some ideas, opened it up for discussion, asked some questions. And we're all kind of talking about it. This one gentleman is middle-aged, and he's been down some rough roads in his life, and he's taken himself down many roads, some very dark roads, and he's done some things that are very regrettable. And so he comes to us in a residential situation, you know, he's not using intoxicants for a while. He's eating three meals a day. He's sleeping at night. He's actually talking to his family on the phone and visits. So he's starting to feel kind of better about himself. But what happens within that is all of a sudden the stuff, he, the places he's been begin to rise up and bubble to the surface. And there's a lot of remorse. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of resentment. And so... I'm talking about this, and we're talking about this, and all, he, he didn't have much to say. And then all of a sudden, he just kind of injected it. He says, you, he says, you don't understand. I know the real me, because I was talking about the real us. I know the real me. And he began to rattle off all this stuff he'd done, horrible things and darkness. And, you know, he's, this is the real me, and, and you can't, you know, and, and, and I, I just have to accept that. And I listened to him. And so I listened to him for a while, and I kind of let him talk himself out, because he had a lot of negative energy around that. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to penetrate that at the time. So I let him talk himself out. I said, um, how do you know that those things you did were wrong? Well, and then he began to tell me how he knew they were wrong. How do you know that, um, how do you know that your contempt for yourself and your anger towards yourself is justified? And he began to talk about why he thought that. So I asked him, I said, where's that come from in you? He said, well, there's a part of me that just knows. See, there it is. I know I'm an artist. I know I'm a minister. I know I want something better. That is a gift that we have as human beings that people like Holmes celebrate imagine all the things we've done as human beings in terms of creativity in terms of bringing creation into fruition where does it all begin to know at some level the fact that i want to heal in some way means i can heal Because if we can't, why would we be given that insight, that inspiration? This is the, you know, we hear the term cognitive dissonance all the time, which is where our thinking is out of alignment. What about, I think about, I think about ethical dissonance, self-esteem dissonance. At some level, I, I don't think I'm worthy, I don't think I'm enough, but there's something in me that keeps pushing. What about this? What about this? What about this? Create, move forward, transform, leave. I mean, that, that's a mind blower where this comes from. And so, and this was really spontaneous in this group I did, and all of a sudden other people began to chime in about, because, they, because it's residential, they live together, they sleep together, they, well, they don't sleep together, okay, we don't do that, but anyway, they're in the same rooms, they eat together, they, they do everything together. I mean, 24-7. 30, 60, 90 days, all these people who never knew each other before, they come together. And suddenly these people will say, you know, this is what I know about you, about you helped me with this. And you were with me when I went through that. And you said some good things to me. And you cared about me. And you, you know, and, and suddenly they were creating the picture of who this guy really is. Because they haven't walked those roads with him. They didn't go down those rabbit holes. They know him, they know him in this environment. And he began to cry. He, he completely broke down because in that moment, it, it came together. The opportunity to create, the opportunity to heal. 
when he was able to be open and accepting, to accept his good, to be open to that. And then the next step is to protect that. You know, I, I've been thinking about this topic because in the last couple of weeks, I was given this topic over a month ago, the title, and then the last couple of weeks, obviously my mind has gone in different directions because of what we're all dealing with right now. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to say something, and, and I think that there's a time and place for things. And so I want to say this very gently and very gingerly. I understand that this virus has touched people uh, has touched people's health and has disrupted families and disrupted jobs. And there's a lot of pain right now. And people have passed away and things like that. But I also know that everyone is, is eternal. And I know that journeys go on. However that is, although there is a time to grieve, there's a time to cry, there's a time to wonder, there's a time to worry. Those are all good things that we can do. But one of the things that I because of what I went through a couple of years ago in paradise and in my life since, because there's been some other losses besides paradise. One of the things about this teaching is, and so I'm going to be the messenger of this, is that our teaching requires us to be open to what is the gift of transformation? What is being stripped away so that we can be receptive and open to a larger expression, individually, collectively. This entire planet is doing this right now. As a planet, what are we opening up to? What are we receptive to in terms of our next stage of transformation? What is it that we are letting go of that is limiting? What is the next stage of evolution? Because for me personally, uh, I know that I have had to do things in the last couple of years that I, I cavalierly did not get involved in before. And now not only do I do them, but some of them I do pretty well. And I have, had, I have been in a relationship where we have been doing some moving. And, and our, our roles in our relationship have changed a great deal. And it's deeper and it's richer and it's more profound. Uh, there were things that I let go of, which were not bad things, but they were simply things that were a stage in my evolution, that were, that were something I needed to move beyond in order to evolve and to move forward. That is part of our receptivity and our openness. If the angel Gabriel, metaphorically, metaphysically, if he is coming down to say, you are in alignment, and so this is your gift, what would we say? What would we say personally, and what would we say collectively? Ernest Holmes said, the soul. Now, the soul in religious science and metaphysics is considered sort of the epicenter of our evolution and change and creativity. It's like the workshop of it. He said, the soul needs a material vehicle, else we would not have evolved one. So he's talking about our life, our bodies, physically here, our houses, our cars, our bodies, our relationships, our clothes, everything. The soul needs a material vehicle, else it would not have evolved one. Great mystics have acknowledged the reality of individuality and have all agreed that the soul is on the pathway of experience, of self-discovery, of evolution, on the way to its enlightened understanding of its mar marvelous relationship with spirit. The kid who was open and receptive enough to splatter paint on the wall and to take a, a creative writing class and a sewing class and find out that he's creative. A person who is 
able to move into ministry. And whatever else that we move into all the time. And this, this understanding that Holmes is talking about in what he refers to as a marvelous relationship with spirit is with all, with all, a union that cannot be broken. The fact that we are larger and greater than whatever expression we find ourselves. You know, the Kabbalah, in terms of the story I just talked about with Mary and Joseph from the Christmas story, it's basically a blend of the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine. The Kabbalah says, they who climb the spiritual ladder alternate between the sacred feminine and masculine aspects of the soul. And the Greeks said, in in ancient Greece, balancing the feminine and the masculine qualities and energies is a prerequisite of spiritual evolution and growth. And so what our teaching in metaphysics tells us is is that our job in terms of creating something new, transcending, transforming, is about coming into balance and seeing ourselves as in alignment with all of these energies. So what is the language of change? What is the language of creation? Ernest Holmes says, we are well advised to access the higher realms of consciousness that of recognizing our own I am-ness. And in our teaching, we talk about the Christ or the highest level of consciousness. It is the I am-ness. That's why our first two stages of prayer is God is and I am. It's that simple. It's not God is and I am, but except, uh, I don't know, not quite. God is, I am. And that's when we find ourselves aligned and open to creativity. All right. So I would like to uh, ask you to join me in a prayer, and I'll put a bow on this. All right. So as we come together in consciousness this day, in the midst of our homes and with our families and our loved ones and wherever we may find ourselves, we know that there is a higher reality to everything that's going on. That in this time of sequester, in this time of what we would call downtime, the seed of spirit is coming forth. And that there is a new manifestation coming forth through each of us individually and collectively. And when we consider the radiance of that opportunity, the grandeur of that opportunity, we are humbled and we are gladdened. We are inspired. And we occupy that place of being in awe of the power of spirit as it works through each and every one of us. Because we are creative beings. And we are here to heal, here to thrive, and here to express. And on this day, I honor all of those attributes in all of us. And I accept those. And I am grateful for them. And in my gratitude for this, I let my word go, knowing that it's so. And so it is. All right. Thank you. Mary? Thank you, Reverend Andy. That was one of the most inspirational talks I've heard in a long time, so you might want to listen to that more than once. I'm sure there's so much there to unpack and realize in the time when we have so much time alone, how to stimulate our creativity and open up to it. But right now, it's time for the offering. And so I invite you to say these words after me. Gratefully, I give with an attitude of abundance. Gratefully, I give with an attitude of abundance. For I know as I give, I do receive. For I know as I give, I do receive. Thank you. And so right now, I'd like to invite you to 
Think about the financial support you can send to this center by way of our website, cslreading.org, and push the donate button or send a check. I pick up the mail every day, and we're always thrilled to get those because at this time for our center is for every business in town. It's a bit of a challenge, so your support is extremely important, and we thank you. So if you would all stand with me, we'll end this service. If you can stand with me, wherever you are. Repeat after me. There is only one life. There is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is perfect. And that life is my life now. That life is my life now. All right, one more time with energy, this creative energy. There is only one life. There is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is perfect. And that life is my life now. That life is my life now. Thank you for joining us today. And just remember, this is a work in progress, so any glitches you may have seen during this, during this production, just know we're, we're getting it. We're getting it. So thank you all. Have a great week, and stay safe.